Hey everyone, this is Leslie Gaston Bird. I am at L Acoustics in London, and this is the Music Hack Space. It's an event series, and um, we've got funding from the Arts Council England, and it's part of the We Move event series. Thank you so much for having me uh, present this uh, presentation on Introduction to Surround Sound and Immersive Audio. And I just want to give a, a shout out again to the L Acoustics team. This studio, the space that I'm in, is amazing. So I hope you all get a chance uh, to come by and visit sometime and learn more about L Acoustics uh, products and software. And just spending the time here uh, with the team here has been uh, absolutely thrilling. So um, be sure that you check it out. OK, so this is an introduction to surround sound and immersive audio. And there have been a lot of these actually going around. It's kind of a trendy topic right now. And I think um, I've seen people just trying to you know, tell people, what is this stuff? What is immersive sound? And it's been around for probably longer than you realize. Um, you might think, well, maybe it started around the 90s, or maybe it started with quadraphonic. But I'd like to uh, take you on a little uh, time travel, a little journey in my time machine to 1933 and this might surprise many of you as a matter of fact 1933 is before both of my parents were born and uh, it was uh, apparently a lot of really cool things were happening with sound around that time and so um, if you're an audiophile or an audio student or a student of sound you've probably seen the equal loudness curves um, these were published by Fletcher and Munson in uh, 1933 in August. And basically what these curves show is that the, the more energy you have for sound, the more even the frequency response. But at very quiet sounds, it is easier to hear higher frequencies. And at very quiet, quieter sounds, it takes more energy for low sounds to sound as loud. That's what the curve means. Um, but this was something that was graphed, charted, analyzed, and discussed in 1933 in August. Well, it just so happens that Harvey Fletcher had another uh, experiment up his sleeve. And that takes us to the Symposium on Auditory Perspective. This was an uh, experiment done between two places, the Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C., and the Philadelphia Academy of Music. And in this experiment by Harvey Fletcher, the goal was to see what is the minimum number of loudspeakers needed to recreate a realistic illusion of sound. So in this, in this paper, they describe an experiment where um, they go to Constitution Hall in D.C., and they set up three loudspeakers. And it might be a little difficult to see on this slide, so I'll see if I can highlight it in yellow for you. And what this yellow image shows is three sound, three speakers, excuse me, a left speaker, a center speaker, and a right speaker. And uh, there's kind of like three columns to the image. The middle column shows where somebody is standing on stage um, and where people uh, perceive the sound fr uh, coming from. But the, the cool thing about this is there was, the stage wasn't Constitution Hall. The stage was in Philadelphia. And they were transmitting sound. This is before we had internet, of course, and this is before uh, we had uh, DSP and Ethernet. This was uh, transmitted over telephone lines. So there was someone uh, on a stage in uh, Pennsylvania and somebody else in a stage in Was and somebody listening in Washington D.C. And they were just doing an experiment to see what, how we can make a realistic sound field. And they came up with the notion of stereo being left, center, and right. So that was given to us by uh, the Symposium on Auditory Perspective. I'll just read a little bit of the paragraph that was published um, talking about this experiment. And it says, a system fulfilling these requirements, and these requirements were for realistic sound reproduction, was constructed and used to reproduce the music played by the Philadelphia Orchestra. The first public demonstration was given in Constitution Hall, Washington, D.C., on the 
evening of April 27th, 1933. So this was before the Fletcher Munson curves were published under the auspices of the National Academy of Sciences. At that time, Dr. Stokowski, and they're talking about Leopold Stokowski, director of the Philadelphia Orchestra, manipulated the electric controls from a box in the rear of Constitution Hall while the orchestra, led by associate conductor Smallins, played in the Academy of Music in Philadelphia. And if you go on the internet and you do research about this uh, very interesting symposium, you'll find out that they had a live audience in uh, attendance for one of these orchestral performances, and the, the audience didn't know that there wasn't an actual symphony behind the curtain. And so, um, it, real fascinating history if you're a history buff out there, especially audio history. Uh, check it out. But here is a picture of uh, Leopold Stokowski. He's in the middle of the picture operating the controls and behind him is Harvey Fletcher. Well, Leopold would go on to uh, collaborate with another, um, this isn't a Harvey, but it's a Mickey. So this is Mickey Mouse and uh, Leopold would go on to continue to work with these um, innovators and in sound. And in 1938, we had Fantasia which was the first surround movie. Fantasia wasn't just a movie, it was an experience. And so on the right hand side of your screen, you see what is not a movie poster, although it looks like a movie poster. This was actually a program, a theater program. So you would go to the cinema, you would sit as if you were going to see a Broadway play, and uh, you would receive a program, and it was supposed to be an experience, as only Walt Disney knows how to do, of course. But in this picture, you see um, someone mounting speakers on the rear of the cinema. And um, this was done so that the listener would be, you guessed it, immersed in sound. In this picture, we also see the first pan pots. So, of course, pot stands for potentiometer. And what you see is three potentiometers ganged together with what looks like a bicycle gear chain. I, I really, I actually am not familiar with this device, so I can only assume that as you turned one gear, the other gear would go down. And so uh, we were sending sound to left, center, and right speakers with these uh, very um, ingenious devices that we all take for granted now. We all have used pan pots, um, assuming you're an audio engineer. Uh, so right now I'm just going to play a little bit of that movie so that you can hear the surround sound experience. And this is from um, um, the uh, remaster of Fantasia. So this disc is called Fantasia 2000. So for the turn of the century they decided to remaster and redo Fantasia. So we'll watch a little bit of this. And um, hopefully, if you are listening in binaural, um, I think this feed is being presented to you in binaural. So hopefully, you'll get to have a sense of uh, immersion and envelopment as we watch a little bit of this movie. Um, I'll, I'm going to jump around a little bit because the exposition to this movie is very long. And of course, we all just sort of want to talk about immersive audio. Um, but you know, we should, we should play some of this. So let's have a listen. Um, and just to give you a preview, you, you can see the, the drama and the spectacle. You know, you got the curtains opening and the orchestra warming up. So let's, let's have a listen.
heard stereo music. It's 1938. This is before stereo on vinyl. It's before stereo radio. So if you wanted this amazing experience, you know, you're hearing the brass here and the xylophones there. And um, definitely must have, for people in 1938, been pretty mind-blowing. I'm just going to fast forward a little bit because it's Fantasia. We want to see the cartoon, so let's see the cartoon. And um, let me just jump around a little bit. I was definitely hearing the motion, the moving. I think today we would kind of shudder. I think if there was a, a, a classical music um, lover, um, definitely classic, people who record classical music, don't pan the violins back and forth. You know, that we don't do that now. But uh, at the time it was, you know, let's play. Let's, let's uh, experiment with this amazing new technology. Um, so, uh, just uh, carrying on with my slideshow. Um, but then, <laughs> this is a very sad slide. This slide shows that World War II happened, uh, and really the innovation that was coming with Fantasound and all these amazing uh, innovations. Um, and creativity had to stop because we were putting everything we could into the war effort. When I say we, I mean the world, you know, um, fighting each other. And unfortunately, this innovation came to an end. But there was one um, kind of important discovery. And of course, we say we discovered it, but of course, the Germans had this technology. And it was the AEG magnetophone. And this was one of the first ways of recording sound to a um, magnetic medium. And uh, magnetic tape, of course, uh, became uh, used after this. It was, um, I guess, John Mullen, who, or I think he went by Jack, Jack Mullen, who discovered this. Um, they refined it, and I believe that led to Ampex. Uh, I know you. The historians out there are going to fact check me on this, but um, I think this is pretty well known history. But I thought I'd also share with you um, uh, what this, how this impacted the immersive sound industry. So um, members of my audience m might have um, these little samples of film. And if you don't have one, you can share one with your neighbor. Um, but what I'm holding in my hand is actually what you see on the slideshow there. So this is what's called full coat mag. I have a whole reel of it actually at my studio, but I just cut off pieces so that you could you guys could see it. Um, and what it means is that you can actually use this to print a soundtrack. You can print six channels of sound on this film, which is great because you know we uh, when they did the Fantasia, they were using an optical format, so all of the sound was going onto optical. Um, was you know had to be developed just like you develop a picture well now we can just you know record it on here but the problem was it was super expensive um, one of the first uh, films to do this and actually this what you'll see in this film isn't a full coat film but they actually had magnetic stripes on uh, each side of the sprocket holes and that's where they put the sound for uh, this picture in Oklahoma was one of the first ones to do this in about 1955. But it was so expensive that, believe it or not, um, most of the films you heard between the 1960s and 1970s were mono. 
because, you know, who cares? <laughs> well, of course we care. I mean, you know, we all heard how fantastic, you know, stereo and surround sound was. Uh, but now uh, we're in a situation here where um, people could not afford it. I mean, let's just put this into perspective. Let's say a reel of this uh, magnetic full coat film costs 200 U.S. dollars in, I don't know, 19 eighty dollars I you know I don't know that much about fluctuating currencies but it was expensive now you need to print you need to print one of these for every cinema in the country in that situation you can see how it's prohibitive to do this for every film you want to make and so the distributor said you know we could make more money if we sold tickets and didn't have to you know we just sold tickets so um, I would recommend, when you have time, go to the Internet Movie Database, and you can look at films based on their sound format. So if you pull up any film, go look at the sound format it was recorded in, and then you can click on that link, and it'll, then you can look at every film that was recorded in that format. And just for fun, look at a film, any film from the 1960s and early 70s. Mono, 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 mono. I've done this. It's, it's amazing. And you're thinking, how, why were we denied for so long? Well, meanwhile, um, there was a, a music phenomenon taking place. So I think it was the 50s. We had vinyl records. And um, I'm not sure of the history of quadraphonic, like who decided to do it and what their name was, etc. cetera. Uh, suffice it to say, there was a format that emerged wherein you could get four channels from a record um, by encoding it in a certain way. And there are a couple of um, notable examples, like Dark Side of the Moon. Um, I also have uh, with me, um, if you uh, are, are looking at me in the inset on your screen right now, uh, I happen to have a Super Audio CD of Dark Side of the Moon. This was in 5.1. It was fascinating listening to Alan Parsons talking about the mix for the quadraphonic versus the 5.1. In quad, the song Money, which starts bump, 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 bump. Well, during the intro, there's cash registers, and he had it timed so each cash register was going around the listener. And when you added a center channel, he's like, wait a minute, you're throwing off the timing. Well, it's in 7-8, but let's not get bogged into details here. Um, but the, the uh, philosophy behind quadraphonic was this matrix surround. So um, this was actually adopted for Dolby Stereo. Uh, again, I'm saying that quadraphonic technology led to Dolby Stereo. Somebody can take, take me to task on that. Um, but it's my understanding that the quadraphonic matrix surround uh, had left and right channels uh, contributing to, uh, let's see, everything that was in phase on left and right went to the center channel. Everything that was out of phase from left and right went to the surround channel or to another channel. And then Dolby adapted this so what I said, center and left surround, right surround. In quadraphonic it would just be left front, right front, left rear, right rear. So that was the principle behind quadraphonic. And I have a little slide for you. This is Lady Gaga. Just kidding, no. That's Barbra Streisand. So Lady Gaga wasn't even born yet. Uh, but this was uh, A Star is Born, and it was the first film uh, to use Dolby Stereo uh, with uh, Matrix Surround. Uh, and then things started happening rapidly. So we had surround sound in the 1930s, we had surround sound in the 1950s, and then we had nothing. And then all of a sudden, here we go, the baby boom. So uh, Star Wars was the first film to introduce a special track that only played bass information. It played this information through the left center and right center loudspeakers. So it wasn't a dedicated subwoofer at that time. And they did this because... For example, with the Todd AO and the, um, the longer 70 millimeter cinema format, there were five speakers in the front of the cinema. And so there were two speakers that weren't being used, the left, um, left center and right center. So not left and right, but the speakers on the inside of the left and right. And so those were the, the speakers that they used to play the bass only information. And as you know, Star Wars was a huge success. 
an understatement of the evening. And then we have um, the first film to have a dedicated sub the very next year, which was Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, I think if you want to hear the effect of that, I would recommend going to the scene where uh, the aliens are communicating with the scientists on the mountain and they're playing that, that do, 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 mom, mom. yeah, that's the scene that you want to check out the dedicated sub. Water break. So um, what, I'm, what I'm doing now here locally in London is I, I have passed out um, these film strips. This is a film, it's called a quad format film, and it has stuff on it. The, um, the analog waveform that you see on the side of the picture is an optical, obviously optical format, and it's called Dolby SR, but then there's Dolby SR. D, spectral reduction digital, and that stuff is in between the sprocket holes. So um, my uh, very lucky guests here in London get to hold this in their hand, hold it up to the light, and if you, if you, for me I have to take down my glasses, but if you look really closely you can see the double D, Dolby Digital logo in the center of that. Um, you'll also see dashed lines on the side of the uh, stereo optical, that's the DTS time code. And then the cyan layer on either side of the film is the uh, SDDS, Sony Dynamic Digital Sound, which carried uh, seven channels. So um, AC3 is uh, most people, I, I can't say most people, anything. But you may have heard it called AC3. That's the acoustic coding that's used uh, in that format. And then, uh, like I said, the cyan layers on either side are the Sony Dynamic Digital Sound. And then there's, there's time code, which are the dashed lines. And most people are familiar with DTS. And I keep saying most people. I need to stop with the generalizations. You may have heard of DTS. Um, and the time code on the film is actually synchronized to an external compact disc, an external compact disc player. And so you get high fidelity CD quality. I'm telling you, in the 1990s, CD quality was the end all. So you get CD quality um, sound. Speaking of CD quality, I want to take a moment to tell you about the LC concept system. This was the front runner to DTS. And if you uh, go on the web and you do a little search, you will find a podcast I did with 20,000 Hertz talking about the woman on the left, Elizabeth Loken. So LC Concept uh, was patented before DTS. And it, what you see is uh, Elizabeth Loken and Pascal Chedevel with their LC Concept system, which is two compact discs that synchronize to time code printed on the film. They were first. There's no doubt about it. It's in the paper. They patented it that way. Um, but what happened was DTS kind of ran with it. And um, I can't uh, assign guilt because I, am, I did not adjudicate the case, but there was a set settlement. So DTS actually did pay um, for, for something. <laughs> Again, I'm not gonna get into legals. But it was um, very uh, suspenseful because when Jurassic Park premiered in France, there were police officers in the projection booth. And they prevented the DTS soundtrack from playing. They said, show, you know, I'm just assuming, show me how this technology works, you cannot use DTS. Because there's an embargo on, or injunction, that's the word, an injunction against this technology as it is being litigated. Fascinating history, just, uh, just amazing. Anywho, Jurassic Park did uh, come out in 1993, and that was the first uh, film uh, to use DTS. I'm just going to go ahead and skip forward several years um, to Dolby Atmos. <laughs> I'm just going to get there because I think everybody's thinking, so when did Dolby Atmos happen? Well, here, here, here it is. Uh, Dolby Atmos uh, um, has a very interesting history. And I would love, I wish this was a more interactive presentation. But I seem to remember, as I was working at a planetarium, we had a device called the Lake Huron. 
and it was a big green tank of a thing, and it had ambisonic technology in there. And um, we were using to spatialize sound in planetariums, and then mysteriously, sorry, I'm adding sensationalism here when maybe I shouldn't, but like Huron got bought out, and I think some of the brains of that found their way into Dolby Atmos. I'm not saying that as a fact, but that's how I remember it happening. And so uh, Dolby Atmos is a system where you can spatialize sound across uh, multiple loudspeakers. Um, that's an oversimplification. We will talk more about Dolby Atmos and what it does, um, but the first film uh, to use Dolby Atmos was Disney's Brave. Um, the Dolby Atmos renderer looks a little bit like this. And uh, again, like I'm sort of previewing what we're going to talk about a little bit later in the afternoon, but the, the principle is you have 10 bed channels, uh, 7.1.2, and then you have several objects that can move around, um, seven, seven channels around, one subwoofer, and, four, and two speakers in the ceiling. And, but the idea is that you can have objects that have metadata assigned to them, and as they move around, they can be reassigned to speakers that happen to be wherever those objects are going. A gross over oversimplification, I know this, but there is, um, and that's what it looks like. So we'll, we'll have a look. Um, we'll do a movie playback in a second, but uh, I just want to mention also Oro 3D, which was another immersive sound format, uh, cinema format. Um, and this one also uses the same speaker layout, um, roughly. The, um, the difference is it's not an object-based system. Yes? Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I, I needed somebody to push back a, a little bit. Otherwise, um, I don't want to misinform anyone. But I think it's, um, it does a, a, a different job of spatializing um, inf audio information across multiple loudspeakers. And the first film uh, to, to feature that was Red Tails, which happened to be directed by George Lucas. So we've come full circle with all of our uh, technology. So um, as promised, I do have a little bit um, to play of Dolby Atmos. So I'm going to um, exit my slideshow and get that prepared. Um, while I'm pulling that session up, does anybody have any questions? Because it's just going to take me a second to, to load that up. I should have bought the girl from Ipanema so that we could not have um, any, any dead space here. But it will just take a second. Question. Oh, yes, question. What happened between Jurassic Park and Dolby Atmos? Not much. I mean, there was Dolby True HD, and there were various um, formats of DTS that were DTS EX, which added a center rear channel. But um, it feels like between 2003 and 2012, Everybody was kind of laying in wait, waiting for the next format. Everybody was perfectly cool. And things started happening really fast where it may have also been that people were um, holding back a little bit. For example, Blu-ray came and went in a blink of an eye, you know. Um, Blu-ray, um, uh, the, the Blu-ray format was such a flash in the pan that I think uh, people were a little bit shy. Um, to really jump in there. Um, and then I was going to say something in addition to Blu-ray being a flash in the pan, because yes, um, you know, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I also bought um, some uh, DVD audio and Super Audio CDs um, that, um, I'm just going to pass these out, so um, sorry people at home, but if you just want to take a, a look at some of those uh, now obsolete formats, <laughs> it's it's just fascinating that you know in 2006 I couldn't wait to get a SACD player. Um, I still have it. Most of the LEDs on it don't work, <laughs> but you know I'm not going to let go of it because um, you know it was it was great. It sounded amazing. It still sounds amazing. You know to listen to the one bit um, uh, very high sample rate format. So I'm just going to um, sort of 
concentrate here for a minute because I need to make some changes. And I'll just make sure this is tracking. Mm, yeah. Let me see here. Go a little bit closer. Ah. So one of the um, one of the advantages of <laughs> see I can't do I can't do the two things at the same time. One of the advantages of um, today's technology is that we can very easily pull up you know a hundred channels on a laptop computer. That is it's it's a lot of fun, but it's also something that takes a lot of concentration. So. Uh, please bear with me while I see if I can get this to connect. Okay. Yes, I am asking way too much of my brain right now. Let's see here. Yes, yes, yes. For those viewers at home, Leslie is looking at her I.O. routing in Pro Tools, making sure that she can connect her Dolby Atmos renderer to it. Leslie is a Dolby Atmos certified engineer. <laughs> we'll get there. It just takes a minute. Um, one of the things we were doing today was uh, we are doing lots of testing, so a lot of things got switched around. Thanks for bearing with me. Oh, that looks better, I think. So just um, reminding everyone about the wonderful environment we are at um, in London here at El Acoustics. The absolute quiet of this place makes the fact that you have to wait even more painful and embarrassing for me. But just we're getting there. Just let me know. When it's <laughs> so um, let's see. This again. Let's see what happens here. Some really weird stuff is happening, and I am fixing it. Ah, oh, yes, please do. Yes, okay, that's cool. awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This <laughs> is Jenny from Music Hackspace. Um, we're really glad that you're with us today. Uh, while Leslie sorts out um, her Pro Tools routing, um, I just want to tell you a bit about her. Um, she's an AVID certified Dolby Atmos professional and a Dante Level 3 certified audio engineer specializing in re-recording, mixing, which is dubbing, and sound editing. She's the former governor at large for the Audio Engineering Society. She's a member of the Royal Recording Academy, not the Royal Recording Academy, the Recording Academy, uh, which is often known as the Grammys. Um, she's also a member of the Cinema Audio Society, the Association of Motion Picture Sound, and Motion Picture Sound Editors. Um, she's worked for National Public Radio, um, Colorado Public Radio, the Colorado Symphony Orchestra, Postmodern Company, and was a tenured associate professor at the University of Colorado, Denver. So we're very, very lucky to have her with us today. Um, and additionally, she's also the writer of the critically acclaimed Women in Audio, which is an excellent book. I've read it and it's smashing. Um, 
and part, that's part of the AES Presents series published by Focal Press, which is Routledge, and you can find it on the internet in all good places that books are sold. How are we doing, Leslie? We're getting there. We're getting there. Okay, I've decided cool. to restart Pro Tools. That is fair enough. <laughs> And something we often talk about at uh, Music Hackspace is how technology is just so technology and sometimes it really does just do what it wants. So um, <laughs> we're, uh, we're, very, uh, we're very used to uh, things occasionally just doing what they want and then we have to um, renegotiate and renavigate them. Um, a little bit about L Acoustics creations which is the space where we are it's an amazing facility oh um we've had a question on the stream so hello darren i've spotted that and i will get to you in a moment um L acoustics creations is based in highgate and it's an incredible um immersive audio facility um with 360 degree sound um if you get a chance to um check it out we highly recommend it we're very lucky to be here today um and they do run a number of events, including uh, immersive audio events like um, Pitch Black Playback. I think I've got that right. Yep, Julie's giving me the thumbs up, so I assume I've got that right. Um, among other uh, incredible events, and they also provide uh, amazing audio technology for a number of stadiums that you've probably been in and not even noticed. So pay attention next time to the fantastic speaker systems in those environments, because you never know, it might have been L Acoustics. Um, right, so, um, Leslie, are you in a position to take a question, seeing as yeah, it's once been asked? Yeah, I can take a question. Okay, Darren um, has asked, um, as you say, Atmos takes a lot from Ambisonics, yet both are being used in their own contexts currently. Are they likely to grow together in popularity, or do you anticipate Ambisonics to be set aside? Oh, that's, a, that's an excellent question, but no, I do not think Ambisonics is going to be set aside. There's so many people who want to experiment with it. Um, every time I go to an AES conference, uh, someone is talking about it, um, and people are still uh, selling um, microphones that record it, so it's you know big for virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, it's, big for gaming, the technology um, is used to upmix things, so Ambisonics is definitely here to say. Um, yeah, so I think Ambisonics is, is not going to be obsolete anytime soon. Awesome, thank you so much, Leslie. Thanks for the question, Darren. Uh, by the way, folks on the stream, if you, um, I realize that I'm literally just like an omniscient voice right now, and that's a bit strange, so you'll see my voice, my face later. Um, but if you do have questions about anything that Leslie uh, is talking about or presenting on, please do drop them in the stream. We'll either um, ask them throughout the presentation or at the end in the designated question time. How are we doing, Leslie? Much better. Okay, cool. Do you need me to keep doing this cool little omniscient voice radio thing or no i think i'm good now okay amazing <laughs> all right i'm gonna hand back to leslie all right everybody so as you were probably aware i needed to recalibrate reinstigate and roll with my new session and all i had to do was restart my software so right now what we're going to do is we're going to look at a little bit of a movie called soul levante and this uh it's s-o-l l E V A N T Sol Levante, and um, the reason I'm playing this one is because it's uh, free to use. Netflix was kind enough to uh, give creators a way to test their systems, to experiment with systems, and so that's what we're about to hear. So um, I'm just going to check a couple more things. Master is selected. Time code is running. And I think we should hear it uh, start shortly. Oh, is that on? We just have um, a little bit of 
disquiet with our clock. Uh, I think this just might be because um, I had to restart the machine. Perhaps Maddie Face is mad at me there in the name. So I'm just going to check a couple of things and maybe see if Chris is around. Uh, it looks like my stream and my format are OK um, on my audio devices. So I'm just going to hope for the best. Also, I noticed my uh, two pop was out of sync. So let me just make sure this is working. And of course, it was working earlier, as you know. So let's try it again. Um, getting access to the set soon if you can. One of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to play a little bit of that again, but this time I'm going to bring the renderer on the screen. And what I want you to do is just sort of check out the, um, the, <laughs> the little green balls that are moving around, I mean, for, for lack of a, a better thing. But I think it just sort of tells the story of the power of Atmos and how it works. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go what is actually happening here. So here is a view of how the render looks in action. <laughs> that was very well timed. <laughs> it was, um, um, anyway, we had a little light show of our own here. It was really cool. Um, but as, as you can see, there are there are objects moving around. So the little green balls are called objects, and they're moving around in space. And that's really the power of Atmos. Is it can take all these whooshes and fireballs, or if you're looking at Lord of the Rings, it might be a, the swish of an arrow or um, a helicopter falling from the sky, you know, if you're into, you know, James Bond action films, and, uh, and move these things around us in uh, really exciting ways. Um, so I think immersive audio and the power of immersive audio comes to us in the cinema, and that's how most people can consume it, is to actually go to the cinema and, 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 um, and enjoy a movie. Uh, Enjoying spatial audio in other ways is not that accessible for ordinary people. And there are a number of reasons for that. I think what manufacturers are trying to do now is make it accessible, you know, make, Air, make AirPods um, upgrade, for example, Apple Music or Amazon HD or any of these other devices so that you can really, you know, just put your headphones on and enjoy it. And uh, what I would like to do, and I think a lot of audio creators, is give that power to the creators as well. So we want people to actually make things that you can experience uh, in spatial audio. And so that's uh, a little bit about what the next part of my presentation is. It's about making it and sharing it. So I'll go back to. Um, my little PowerPoint here. And um, share with you, uh, let's see, yes, 
um, a, the second half of my presentation, which is immersive audio recording and mixing. I'm going to, you know, I don't want to move fast. There is so much information here. And as a matter of fact, you know, one of the things I like to do, if you don't mind a little bit of shameless self-promotion, um, please get in touch with me at l.gaston-bird at surrey.ac.uk because I am developing curriculum so that we can take longer to sort of um, ex ex experience this and understand how to use these tools. So please get in touch with me because um, we're not going to do this in 45 minutes. I think it really does take uh, a lot of investment of time, but it, hopefully you'll find it ex ex inspiring and, and you'll want to uh, get involved. So um, with that said, I shall proceed. There's a couple ways you can record immersive sound. One uh, at, at the top is uh, ambisonic mic and um, I used this to record a Norwegian trio. I'd like to play this for you, uh, but I don't think we're going to have time. Um, I, you know, I really want you to hear this, but, but we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, the next one down there, uh, you'll see me talking to uh, Fritz. We call him Fritz. The Neumann KU100 binaural head. Is it KU100? Not KM100, KU100. Okay, uh, the binaural mic. So. Um, these are two ways to record uh, uh, two ways to record immersive sound. There's another one. I noticed my slides are out of order, but I'm just going to skip ahead. There's also classical recording techniques for uh, recording uh, immersive sound, and here are just five. There are more, and you know, please please leave a couple in, in the comments if I've left out your favorite. I know I noticed decatry is not on here, so you, but you can still put it if you want to just type decatry in the chat box. Be my guest. There's uh, Hamasaki Square. Uh, Kimio Hamasaki developed this recording technique, the optimized cardioid triangle OCT at the bottom. It's where you have uh, three cardioid microphones pointing that way. Look at this slide. <laughs> the Trinov array was really fun. I, we got to experiment with this when I was teaching at the University of Colorado. And this is another way of recording um, immersive sound. The IRT cross, which uh, IRT stands for? I can't remember. Nobody remembers. That's OK. I put you on the spot. I understand. I'll remember probably at 3 in the morning. I'll post it on my Instagram. And then the double mid-side technique. So lots of ways to record. Um, immersive sound, but you don't have to use those techniques uh, for ex um, because there's other ways. So I'm just going to back up again and go forward again. So this ambisonic mic that you see, top center, uh, is actually it consists of uh, four microphone capsules arranged in a tetrahedron, and they output what's called an A format signal. That A format signal has to be converted to a B format signal. And that gives you four channels, W, X, Y, and Z, that you can then decode into a surround sound uh, recording. Skip ahead two slides. And uh, then the way that you would hear that back is you would have your sound playing from your digital audio workstation to your audio interface through some balance uh, outputs or, if you have digital speakers, through digital interface to powered loudspeakers. And so those are, are, that's usually the signal flow that you would do to make a immersive sound recording and listen to it. That's kind of the workflow. Um, if you are the average consumer and, um, oops, I'm sorry, that's not what this one's for. This slide represents wh how you can play back immersive sound if you don't have tons and tons of money. You can buy an audio video receiver and uh, go HDMI from your computer into the receiver and have Atmos playback at home. So you don't necessarily need uh, to do all the things that I just had said. You can do it this way as well. Um, you have your loudspeakers and your television monitor. And I spend uh, a lot of time, you know, sometimes like in preparation for this lecture, I went and I, I was just thinking, well, how am I going to play Fantasia for people? How, you know, how am I going to go from a DVD image that I got from 2000 
and play it for people. And I actually used a program called VLC. And um, another thing you might want to try if you're you know, doing this on a super low budget is there's, uh, if you upgrade to Mac OS Monterey, you can now access the 7.1.4 loudspeaker setup. So we've been waiting for this for a little while. So please, um, you know, if you're, not, if you're not squeamish, try to, just try. Go to Monterey, take the leap, and then you'll get these, these little nice surprises. Um, in order to listen to binaural, um, you don't need an audio interface. Uh, you can listen to binaural just on your, um, on your mobile phone. There's, there's plenty of uh, binaural recordings out there, and you can listen that way. If you want to create and originate your own binaural uh, sounds, you can do that with your digital audio workstation. And unlike 10 years ago, um, I know, for example, New Window comes with ambisonic decoders in it so you know good for everybody I mean it's it's a lot easier to do now uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, kind of sort of psychoacoustics so I'm just like I said I'm, I'm keeping aware of the time and there's so much to go over but as we talked about stereo started as three channels left center and right uh, but now everybody kind of thinks stereo is two channels. So in the picture on the left, you have a, a speaker in the center of the left and right conveying information to you. On the photo to the right, you have a phantom center. And in this situation, you have a speaker on the left, a speaker on the right, and that creates the illusion of having a center image. But the problem is that only works one direction, which is in front of you. Um, this is called, this little picture shows the butterfly effect, excuse me. So if you have, um, for example, speakers behind you, you do not have a phantom image to the right of you. And the reason you don't have a phantom image to the right of you is that you don't have an ear on your forehead and the back of your head. That's what it would take to have a phantom image to the right. So the problem is when we're working in surround sound, as we're panning from the front to the right to the side to the rear, we get these weird sort of splits in the image. So it's really hard to get a 360 degree pan just because we don't hear that way. We don't have four ears, and we don't have seven ears. We have two. And that is why, um, you know, for example, having five speakers is kind of a good idea. The problem is, because of that butterfly effect, the sound field tears between the front and the rear. So we put some more speakers in there, <laughs> and then, you know, we're, we keep trying to solve this problem of, uh, sound fields that are split and tearing and not continuous, but who has room for all those loudspeakers? Well, L Acoustics does, let me tell you, they're all over the place. They're in the ceiling, they're on the wall. So it's, it's grand to be in here because we do have room for all these speakers, but you know, um, some people don't. There is an effort to get binaural and, and to get um, some psychoacoustic trickery going on so that you can perceive sound from all around. The jury's out as to whether these things are effective. So, um, you know, not all immersive sound is binaural. Not all two-channel immersive sound is binaural. Um, so, again, like if you're, if you're gaming and you're, you've got head tracker and you're, you know, moving around the sound field and your gameplay is moving with you, that's not necessarily binaural. That's some other magic not covered in this lecture. All right, so let's see. We've talked about recording, and we've talked about playback a little bit. Uh, we dipped into some psychoacoustics. One thing I want to talk about is the uh, subwoofer. So in, um, these are subwoofers, right? There are subwoofers down here? OK. There's three of them. Is there three? There's many? Oh yeah, because they're they're all like there are a lot of subwoofers in here, and uh, I'm just guessing is because we want 
just based on the design of the speakers, we're trying to achieve a full range experience all the way around the room. Yeah. So, um, in your home system or in your cinema, it's not necessarily that way. You might have one, two, four subwoofers because in, if you're in a cinema, you've got these huge, you know, car sized speakers. And at home, you don't have to, you know, you don't have that much space to cover. So, one or two uh, subwoofers. So the reason that we use um, the low frequency effects channel in, in movies is to create big booms, just like we saw in the Soul of Vante. You know, the, the evil spirit monster is um, wreaking havoc, and so we need explosions and loud sounds. We saw Fletcher Munson from 1933 demonstrating why we need extra help at low frequencies, because we need more power to hear them as loud as other frequencies. Um, so that, there's a lot of stuff on that slide. I'm just going to move along. Like I said, I'm minding the time. Um, I think, too, if you look up the Recording Academy guidelines, you can learn um, more about how to mix effectively in surround. And I do have another mix that I want to play. Um, we're just going to cross our fingers and make sure this works. But before I do, before I do, I'm just going to pull up um, this, um, this, these guidelines about panning a sound all around. Okay. One potential problem that can arise from routing a signal into two or more speakers is the danger of comb filtering. So there's an acoustic comb filtering that happens if you have a sound in more than one speaker. If you have more speakers, it becomes a, a bigger problem. And so um, this is why many what they call experienced surround mixers turn off channels when bringing a sound inside the surround bubble or panning a sound from at one area to another. Where, and it, whenever a signal is placed into three or four or five speakers, Speakers, it should be decorrelated, I mean it should sound slightly different in each channel. So um, what this means is if you have uh, the Pro Tools panner and you have a sound panned in the min middle, that does not mean the sound is coming from where you're sitting. It's coming from five speakers at the same time and it's you know probably going to sound a little funky because your speakers aren't matched. So that is the point of that particular slide. And soloing or muting loudspeakers. I'm just going to keep rolling through these because I think there's, you know, I recommend that you download the uh, Recording Academy guidelines, please, and, and have a look at them if you're interested in mixing. But what I'll do is um, play a little bit of uh, Morph the Cat. Morph the Cat was an album released in around 2006, I believe, and it's one of the first Super Audio CDs I bought. It sounds amazing in 5.1, but the cool thing for me as I taught the subject was that I could solo each channel or I could mute different channels. And a lot of artists, for example, I, so let me be careful with what I say. I would imagine that if I was Donald Fagan, who you are about to hear, I would not want people to solo these different channels because the vocal performance in each channel is a little shaky. But when they're played together, it sounds you know, incredible. It sounds cohesive. So um, we might have to do a little song and dance again as I bring this session up. But please feel free to talk amongst yourselves. Um, which is a little hard to do on the internet, unless the Discord server is up, and then you can. But uh, what I'm doing right now is I am loading the, uh, sat the Morph the Cat album. And I almost want to say, like, if you get some time to enjoy this, um, this album, uh, it's a little... Um, prescient. It's a little foreboding because he's talking about how times change and um, uh, but times always change so maybe it's not prescient maybe it's just observational. All right I am now changing my IO setup so that we can listen 
So all I have to do, hopefully, is one of these. <laughs> Let me just hit play for a second and we'll see. Okay. Here we go. this album so much it is just it's so groovy um, but you can hear um, or, or what I'll play for you rather is kind of the difference between this song in surround and the song in uh, in stereo so I'm just gonna go um, just pick a point at random and so if you're watching the stream or you're watching here uh, in person at L Acoustics in London you'll be able to see when I'm muting and uh, unmuting the top stereo tracks versus uh, the top surround tracks rather versus the bottom stereo so I won't be calling out the changes just um, if you could just follow along with what you see on your screen and so here we go <laughs> Just um, getting a sense, of course, I didn't sample line the thing. I know. I've done listening tests before. I know better. Um, but yes, um, just listening to uh, the stereo versus the surround, you gain a, an appreciation uh, for what you're hearing. But the other thing that's fun to do, and this is where Donald is, is throwing his shoe at me. From <laughs> Donald doesn't care. He doesn't know I'm doing this. Um, so the other thing that's fun to do is sort of uh, mute and solo um, different channels of, of the mix and before uh, stereo sound we couldn't do that. You know, I'm rambling a little bit but I'm just gonna say 
when the Beatles did their stereo stuff in the 60s, that's how people were learning the guitar parts. Like they would just turn one speaker off because the guitar was panned over here. So, I mean, this is kind of the same. Um, so let's see what happens when we just kind of mess around with it. that all night long. That's so fun. Um, I mean, it's fun from an instrumentation point of view. It's fun from an audio engineering point of view. It's fun from a musician point of view. Uh, I just, you know, love, you know, listening to those, those parts, um, you know, a little bit discontinuously just to get a feel of how they did it. And, and that's cool to me. That's kind of why I do this stuff. So thank you, Surround Sound, for being awesome. Um, just continuing with uh, my uh, presentation, with my slideshow rather. Uh, so as, as you witnessed earlier, it's kind of a pain uh, working with a digital audio workstation because you have to constantly review your I.O. setup. Um, if you're switching from Atmos to stereo, from stereo to ambisonics, from ambisonics to mono and teaching and doing all this kind of thing, wow, you really have to be on top of it. And a lot of what you have to do, uh, Pro Tools users, is be on top of your I.O. setup. I'm going to fly through these slides because this is not a tutorial on how to set up your I.O., but it's just a couple things to think about. Uh, you have to create a 5.1 path or 7.1 path, or 7.1.4 path, or 7.1.2 path. And these are the, some of the places where you can set that. Um, in this particular example, uh, what we're seeing is uh, the sub paths to each path. So you can, if you have a 5.1 channel, you can, and you want to assign something to stereo, there is a sub path, in this case, elephant stereo. So if you want to have, for example, stereo keyboard in your mix, you might assign it just to elephant stereo. Or you might decide to have just a stereo pair that are rear channel. So you could have an LSRS stereo pair in your subpath as well. Um, here in your bus tab, again, you want to look for um, how you're mapping it to your output, which is a little bit different than mapping it to the renderer. Um, this just has to do with setting up a reverb channel, for example. So in your, in your uh, 5.1 bus, you will probably have 5.1 reverbs. Um, I'm not going to do the mix from scratch example. So sorry, because <laughs> of time. Um, but one of the things I think is important to mention is what I was doing earlier dur during the break is I was blowing out all of my all of my paths so that I could grab them from the renderer, which is kind of a handy thing to do. So the renderer is uh, providing you, actually, let me stop my slideshow for a second, just so, because this is interesting to see. So this is my renderer, and my renderer can be configured to um, 
to have a, a number of beds. The first ten are always fixed, and these objects can change back and forth. And what you're able to do is have Pro Tools grab this configuration from the renderer, and in that way you can make sure all of the objects that you set up are being mapped the, to the Dolby Atmos renderer so that it can put its special met metadata stuff with each of the objects. So this is um, a handy thing to do and an important thing to do, but it also means you have to be confident enough to say, I'm going to delete all of my output settings. I know there's 118 of them, but I got to get this right, delete. And um, pretty soon you'll get nimble at doing that and also knowing when it's just time to reboot the software. Uh, your playback engine, if you're doing this at home, is going to be your Dolby Audio Bridge. So I'm using, uh, in my Pro Tools setup, I'm using the Dolby Audio Bridge to send sound to the renderer. And in my per peripherals, I am enabling Dolby Atmos. And when that um, the renderer is open, that little green light comes on. So a second ago you heard me talk about grabbing configurations. What does that mean? Well, Dolby comes with, um, the way Dolby's set up, there are 10 bed channels and then 118 objects. And those bed channels are in a 7.1.2 configuration. The beds um, always use the first 10 channels, but then there are 118 available um, objects. So basically, if you set up a Dolby Atmos session, you have a 128 channel mix, which seems bonkers. But you saw how they used it on Soul Levante. I mean, they were using a lot of them. Uh, and one of the most popular questions that I get, and I know I had this question when I started around, is what is the difference? between a bed and an object. And I can't remember if it was Carrie Thomas or Dave Tyler or one of the very, very cool people at Dolby who explained it to me this way. The beds are like the forest. So you can have a stereo bed or 5.1 bed or 7.1.4, which is four ch uh, channels in the ceiling. But objects are the things that move around. So an owl flying in the woods or a fox walking on the forest floor um, and <laughs> it's things that move around with metadata. So that owl has metadata associated to it so you know where it is in the sound field. Same with the fox. So an Atmos mix, it's almost, hey, this is like one of those optical illusions where it's like, can you find the owl? Yes, it's fine. You know, so there's the owl and there's, there's the fox. And so that's what an Atmos mix is comprised of, your beds and your, um, and your owls and foxes, your objects. And the other question I have, now listen carefully, because this is this will kind of change your, your thinking about beds and objects. But Leslie, you say, if I have a 5.1 bed, can't I pan stuff around? And the answer is yes. Of course you can, you can pan stuff around your 5.1 bed or your 7.1.4 bed. What you won't have is the metadata that goes with your little owl that's flying around. So if you were to take your mix to a cinema and play your mix in a cinema and your cinema has 100 channels, 100 loudspeakers, your metadata for the owl is going to tell it which one of those loudspeakers it is flying around in. Your 7.1.4 bed is not going to do that. It can try it probably won't be as nice as if it had some metadata sending it to each speaker. It's going to be relying on phantom imaging and as we saw earlier it's a little harder to create a smooth pan when you're relying on two speakers in any two places in your room. So that is why we need that. Uh, if you create um, audio, so the next thing is you're going to output something from the renderer. And the thing that you output is called the Dolby Atmos, Atmos master file. Um, you'll have an Atmos file, which is what the renderer can open, an Atmos.audio file, which is all of the audio used in the mix, so it's the big file that you get, and the Atmos.metadata, which is where are my fox and my owl. 
So for example, on the bottom, I have a song called Cockpit Crazy. And so when I hit render on my Dolby Atmos renderer, those are the files that it spits out for me. We're getting there, everyone. So thanks for hanging in there. I know this is, this is super like heady stuff, but I think you, you guys are heading on, uh, hanging on. If you're in this lecture, you're probably curious about it, and I bet every single one of you can get it. Um, you can download the Dolby Atmos renderer uh, for 30 days, 60 days. Uh, somebody in the chat probably knows. And when you, um, when you start to play with it, yeah, you, you start to get it. Um, I think you do need to go through a tutorial because it's not intuitive, but hopefully this lecture is giving you a good foundation. So um, in the renderer, you have to choose a driver. So if you're working in Pro Tools, your playback engine is the Dolby Audio Bridge. If you're working in Dolby Atmos renderer, the input is the Dolby Audio Bridge because it's bringing in sound from Pro Tools. And then your output, in my case, is a Sapphire by Focusrite. Um, but it could be, in this, in this room, it's uh, the Maddie Face by RME. Or it could be an HDMI if you're using your uh, home AV receiver. So it's the audio bridge that sends your sound to the speakers. Uh, your peripherals, I think we talked about that earlier. You want to make sure Pro Tools Dolby Atmos is enabled and uh, part of that network, and that your connection status is blinking. And then uh, check your channel order in uh, the renderer. It's uh, the SMPTE channel order, so left, right, center, LFE. Uh, this is not the same as the bus order, so just make sure. This is one of the reasons why I always have a channel check file. So I actually recorded myself saying left channel, right channel, center, LFE, left surround, right surround. And then I assign each one of those clips to a different channel so that I know, you know, which channel is going where. And then uh, in the render, I think we talked about you can have uh, the first 10 are always beds. So you could have just a, you could have five stereo beds, or you could have a 5.1 bed and a stereo bed, or any combination, but your objects always start at number 11. And then we did a demonstration there. You can also use Dolby Atmos Render to create binaural mixes, and so you would use headphone processing and choose binaural. And there are, um, there's a binaural mode um, where you can see for each object in your mix, uh, which, um, which channel is, is what. <laughs> Sorry, that made no sense. So you can choose mid, uh, near, and far uh, for each one of your beds for the, for the renderer. So that just gives, um, Sorry, mid. What would I do to change that? I really can't see. I have to bring this down because I can't see what I'm doing. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, without getting into details, actually, you can use a binaural configuration scheme from Pro Tools to, to choose which one of these are mid and near and far. And that's just how close or far away each object is from you as you're panning it around. Too much. This is a, a lot to get through, um, but I think it's super fascinating. So I'm just going to keep going, go back to my slideshow. And um, oops, wrong button. I think the thing that I want to get to that I'm kind of rushing to is how you can make your own mix. So when you bounce your mix, when you get the renderer in, check this out. Remember how you used to have MP3 and MOV? Well, now you've got a Dolby Atmos ADM uh, wave file. So uh, that's pretty handy to have. So you can bounce uh, Atmos file from Pro Tools, which is, um, uh, which is useful if you want, if you want to upload your stuff to, for example, DistroKid or CD Baby. And so those platforms now allow you to upload a spatialized mix. So, um, for example, DistroKid uh, can get, uh, has a distribution deal with Tidal and Apple Music. 
CD Baby has um, a deal with Apple Music. And so when you go to upload your mix, drum roll please, this actually brings me to the end of my, uh, to the end of my presentation. But this is, for example, on DistroKid. It asks you if you have um, a spatial audio mix. And for the first time, ladies and gentlemen, please hit yes. I would like everybody to upload a song and hit yes on this, having made a spatial audio Dolby Atmos mix. So um, there you have it. I think, I think I've covered everything that I can cover uh, in this 90 minutes. And I just want to say uh, a little thank you. Before we end, though, and before we start taking questions uh, uh, virtually and in person, I just want to invite you to an interview. So this is uh, part of a, um, a PhD project I'm doing. So I'm really glad to be here, really glad to be bringing you this information. And um, thank you, everybody. Thank you to 2% Rising. Um, thank you to... Um, Yes, Music Hack Space. I just want to say this, these series are incredible. I can't believe you know you've done dozens of these, and you guys should be so proud because this is really empowering. Um, the We Move event series. Please uh, check out your Instagram and check out uh, the next uh, events that are coming up. Um, but in the meantime, if this has helped you, uh, if it hasn't helped you, if you found anything useful here. Uh, I just want to have some time to talk to you. So will you please email me, l.gaston-bird at surrey.ac.uk. This is a PhD I'm doing uh, called Immersive and Inclusive. So I'm hoping to disseminate information about how to make your own immersive mixes. And I, wanna, I just want to have a chat and see what, um, how you have been impacted by this presentation and where you are in your audio career. I think it's, uh, like I said, super fascinating. And um, yes, that invitation is yours. Um, so please, please get in touch. So thank you, everyone, again. And uh, yeah, now we, I guess we'll move to some questions from our audience. We will indeed. Thank you so much, Leslie. I'm just going to say a quick yeah. hi. Thank you. Very, much. very quickly thank you. hello to everyone on the stream <laughs> and thank you so much leslie that was fantastic uh we are going to ask some questions now um i'm going to um kick off with a question from the stream um so uh first question is from high harmonics uh is asking uh what about other doors so ableton live logic etc oh yeah absolutely other DAWs are great for immersive audio uh, logic does have the dolby atmos production suite so if you have logic um please check it out you can you do dolby atmos uh, on logic uh, Ableton, I'm not actually sure in the window you can oh i've got someone shaking their head in the <laughs> front in the front no Cannot. Um, but um, New Window, I'm pretty sure you can. New Window got, got a nod there. So um, let's see. Uh, Reaper, I'm not sure if you can do it in Reaper. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, but yes. So other DAWs, yes. Other doors, yes. I'm moving in that direction. Um, yes. Okay. If there are any questions in the room, could you please raise your hand? In the meantime, I will keep <laughs> rolling. Oh, yep. Yeah, okay. Do, 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 do. <laughs> to the tiny box. <laughs> um, so you, talk, uh, you talked about immersive audio for movies and music. And do you think objects are useful for immersive music mixing? For, oh, yeah. So, for, yeah, it's kind of hard to say. It depends on your venue. Um, I'm not a Hollywood film designer, but I would imagine that if there's uh, a call for a Hollywood film composer to do something that involves music traveling around yeah it would be useful but i think if you're like especially if you're doing orchestral recording i don't think you need objects uh if you're doing band recording maybe not but i don't know there's some really avant-garde stuff out there where you've got arpeggiators and stuff moving around so maybe i think it first you have to start with artistic intent and is your intent for that song to be up mixed to an environment where there's more than 7.1.4 speakers. If yes, then yes. If no, then probably not. But again, I'm not. That's that's not my um, my primary field. So it'd be interesting to hear what other people have to say. Thank you. Cool. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so um, another question. 
Oh, actually, that was uh, someone, uh, Technocosm, commented Ableton can with Live 11 Suite and some Ableton Max plugins. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, for that info. Um, where do you see immersive audio going next? Uh, where hasn't it been? That's the <laughs> question. Um, thank you for that uh, question. Um, where is it going? There are some really crazy innovations going on. It was only a couple of years ago where we started talking about um, acoustic bubbles. So, for example, if you have four people in a car, everybody could have their own acoustic, like what they're listening to. I have two kids. They're ages 10 and 12. They cannot stand to listen to each other's music, or at least one can't stand to listen to the other. Wouldn't he like to have his own sound bubble? You know, so that, that's a thing that's happening. Um, and then, of course, gaming, I think it's only limited by people's imagination. Um, so I think really the areas to watch are, you know, the gaming industry seems to be, and the uh, audio for virtual and augmented reality, don't forget, um, in Seattle this August. Uh, so I think a lot of innovations are to be found there. Hi, Leslie. Uh, uh -huh. I was wondering, what do you think about the, um, the devices to diffuse? immersive audio because we, we have binaural for uh, with headphones and that that's easy but and then we have venues like an acoustic supported but in between for consumers what 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 people can can have as devices at home oh, to yeah. have immersive audios that's yeah that's tricky i mean at my house for example i mean even in the 90s i wanted to have dolby pro logic so i went out and i bought two rear speakers and a center speaker and I wish that more people would listen that way. Um, right now there's sound bars that do things and up-firing up speakers that do things um, to sort of simulate that environment. Um, I'm still really crazy about just having a physical speaker, you know, on the left, center, right, left, round, right, round. I can't do the sides. Um, but it, I don't know, was that your question, like how people at, at, at home can enjoy it in that sort of like mid-range of binaural versus the bigger venues? Yeah, no, I guess my, my question is, do you, do you think we're limited by the devices that people can, can equip their home with? Because if you have stereo at home, that's not immersive Yeah, I, th I think we are limited in that way, but there's some pretty... Pretty cool technology, for example, coming out of University of Surrey. I just want to do a little tip of the hat to Craig. Oh, Craig, I, I can't pronounce your last name. I can see it written in my head, but I don't think I could say it. But Craig C. Craig um, C. at Surrey. <laughs> Craig C. at Surrey is actually doing something where you use the existing devices in your house to recreate sound. So that's pretty cool. So everybody you know like you ha happen to have a bluetooth speaker over here or your phone's over here or your television's here you know can we use the, the devices around your house to to um to create those sound fields so yeah there's some really cool stuff going on yeah <laughs> cool the stream's gone a little bit quiet is there any are there any other questions in the room no cool all right um, I think we'll probably wrap it there, um, in which case, thank you so much, uh, Leslie, for your time. Um, for those who, um, again, I'm just going to hover here for a minute. For those who haven't uh, found uh, WeMove before or you're new to WeMove, WeMove is a series of curated seminars that are helmed by technological and musical experts who happen to be women and non-binary. Um, there are 25 of them all together. We're, we're kind of well over the halfway mark, but we've got more to come. So do check them out uh, on our YouTube channel and uh, you can find all our courses at musichackspace.org. Um, and Leslie, where can people find you? Well, thanks for asking. Um, there's lots of ways to find me again, leslie.gaston-bird at surrey.ac.uk. I'm on Facebook, leslie.gaston. LinkedIn, Leslie.Gaston, Instagram, Leslie.Gaston, Twitter, Mix Messiah Prod. Ooh. Yeah, so I threw a little wrench in there, but yeah, uh, find me on the socials. Okay, well, thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you, thank you very much for Al Acoustics for hosting us today so beautifully, and uh, we'll see you at the next one. <laughs>